Howdy, so excited to be with you. Today, I'm not preaching, I just get to attend my favorite church. And, uh, and we need more parking. And so it's really good to see all of you. Uh, my name is Pastor Mark, and today I'm really honored to uh, introduce a special guest, a dear friend in my pastor, Pastor Jimmy Evans. Are you excited to hear from Pastor Jimmy? So Pastor Jimmy, you can pray for he and his wife, Karen. They've got their 50th wedding anniversary coming up just in a few weeks. We're super excited about that. Uh, he spent uh, almost his entire life and adult life as a Bible teacher and a pastor. And uh, he's got two major ministries, EXO, which is uh, marriage ministry. How many of you familiar with it? Get the resources from EXO, love and appreciate it. And I just wanna publicly thank Pastor Jimmy for allowing Grace and I to be part of that platform and part of that family, helping to strengthen marriages in addition uh, he's got endtimes.com, and that's what he's going to speak about today. Are we living in the end times? And uh, he likes to talk about prophecy and God uh, giving us a glimpse into the future. If you want to know a little bit more about his talk today, you can grab his book, Tipping Point, also the uh, name of his podcast. And I asked him in specific to talk about prophecy for this reason. Uh, he's been very prophetic in my life, in our family, and in our church family. Uh, when we uh, were considering starting Trinity Church, uh, Pastor Jimmy being one of our overseers and pastors that we're accountable to and under the authority of, talked to him and said, hey, the kids wanna plant a church. Uh, they wanna call it Trinity Church. Could you pray about that and see if that's the Lord's will? And he confirmed that this church plant was the Lord's will. And we wouldn't have gone forward without his blessing and the blessing of a few other pastors that we admire and respect and authority over us. And then it came time to uh, buy a building. So uh, I was trying to figure out where we would meet. And so I flew to Dallas and uh, had uh, breakfast or lunch with Pastor Jimmy. And he asked, what are you gonna do for a building? I said, well, I'm not sure. He said, uh, what do you think? And I said, well, I think we'll probably have to rent something like every broke church plant and start where we start. He said, no, God's gonna give you a building. It's gonna seat 800. It's gonna be off the 101 in Scottsdale. It'll be historically grandfathered as a church. It'll be up to code to just start using it immediately and you're gonna be able to purchase it. You won't need to rent, so just wait. I was like, that's very specific. Um, <laughs> it's very specific. So I, I called the realtor and the realtor said, that church has never existed. And then I got another call saying, there is actually that church coming on the market. And, uh, and so then um, we were able to purchase it and God pr provided us a miracle. And we're in the middle of the rebuilding home campaign to finish it. And I kid you not, it was our first full Easter. Our church is now, I think, six years old. We set up every single chair and we had 793 seats, if memory serves me correct. And I looked at Pastor Brandon and I said, Pastor Jimmy is this close to being a prophet. And, uh, <laughs> and then, then we looked in the sound booth. I kid you not that Pastor Brandon will confirm this. Seven seats in the sound booth, exactly 800 seats <laughs> off the 101, historically grandfathered in Scottsdale. Um, so if you need a house, ask Pastor Jimmy. He'll prophesy one in for you. He's good at that. He's got that real estate anointing. Uh, <laughs> and so it's a real honor for me to have Pastor Jimmy come and preach in the building that he prophesied. He prophesied that our church would start small and God would keep a veil over it and then he would lift it and there would be a season of incredible growth. And he's prophesied many seasons of our, of our church life together. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to publicly honor him and thank him tell him how much uh, we love him and he means to me and to us. And uh, it's really an honor for me. And I'll just, I'll, I'll share one more thing. Uh, we met uh, about seven years ago and I didn't really know Pastor Jimmy. And I was at the lowest point of my whole life uh, after serving at 18 years at a church and seeing God do wonderful things that we're forever grateful for with people we love. God spoke to us and released us in the darkest, most difficult season of our life. And I was scheduled that week uh, to go preach at a conference and I canceled all of my engagements and I exited social media, uh, just mentally, emotionally, spiritually, just wasn't doing that good and just really needed to hear from the Lord and spend time with Grace and the kids. And uh, I canceled this event that I was gonna speak at. And they, uh, they asked me, no, please come. We just wanna see you even if you don't speak. And I told Grace, I said, I, I just feel like the Holy Spirit has told me that I'm supposed to go and I don't know why. And I really don't wanna go. Um, it, was a, it was actually a safety um, season at our home and I didn't wanna leave Grace and the kids. And I went and uh, I was backstage 
And uh, I met a guy named Pastor Jimmy Evans. And I think we talked for, I don't remember, maybe 30 seconds. He was like, I'm Jimmy. I'm, I was like, I'm Mark. He's like, I got to go to work. I was like, God bless. So that was it. That was our time together. And, uh, and then Pastor Jimmy got on the stage uh, before about 4,000, mainly pastors, made me stand up and prophesied the rest of my life. Um, and I was like, I hope this is the Lord because I'm already having a bad day. And, uh, <laughs> and so this is never aired publicly ever. And I found the film. And so what I'm gonna do, uh, so Pastor Jimmy, you didn't tell me you were gonna prophesy over me, so I didn't tell you that we're gonna show the video of you prophesying over me. <laughs> now we're even. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you where Pastor Jimmy and I met, and then I'm gonna ask you when he comes up to teach, to stand, to welcome him, and to uh, really give him your appreciation. He's now, uh, would be in our wise council. He was a founding board member of Trinity Church and now is wise council and one of our overseers. And so I want you to do a good job honoring him. But first I'll show you the video. I've got something I wanna say before I preach. To Mark Driscoll. Stand up Mark if you would for just a minute. And uh, you know, I, I, it's, first of all, it was an honor to meet you. I met you before the service for the very first time, but um, you know, as I was sitting over there, I heard the Lord speaking something that I want to say to you, and I want to say it publicly. And that is, you led a great movement uh, of young people, and you led them as an older brother. And uh, you'll return as a father. And it'll be a greater movement, Mark. I'm not for that. I'm not for You're just starting to get prophesied over, bud. <laughs> your scars will heal millions. And the transition that you're going through in your life right now is very important for what God's going to do in the next season. Your latter years will be greater than your former years. Man looks on the outside, Mark, but God looks at the heart. And God sees integrity in your heart, Mark. You have a heart of integrity. And you're here because of your integrity. And you're gonna make it through this process because of your integrity. And God wants you to know, and God wants these people to know that he has a plan for you. He has a future and a hope for you. And his plan for your future is good. God bless you. Okay, I'm crying. <laughs> you shouldn't, you shouldn't show me. I just love Pastor Mark and Grace so much. I had forgotten about that. When you showed it, it just brought all that back. And what wonderful people you are. And the enemy, that song that we were singing, God's never lost a battle. The enemy did everything he could to take you out. And he didn't. <clears throat> you're, such a, you're such a man of integrity, Pastor Mark. I love you with all my heart. I'm so thankful to be a part of your life, Grace's, your life, your family, in this church. I'm, I'm just so proud of all that God has done through you. Pastor Mark and Grace are exactly the same people behind the scenes as they are when you see them up here. Very submitted uh, through the years. Uh, I have been very honest with them. They've never made any mistakes. They really haven't, but they've been very submitted. And I'm very opinionated, and that goes together really well. <laughs> <laughs> so, totally submitted people of integrity. And I just love them so much. It's so great to be here. There's so much has happened to the building since I've been here last time. It's just phenomenal what God is doing. Thank you for letting me be here. I'm going to try not to cry anymore. And, uh, 
Well, I want to talk about <clears throat> prophecy. The, uh, now, my wife and I will celebrate our 50th anniversary, <laughs> May the 11th. That's a lot. That's a big deal. And uh, I got saved a week before we got married. A week before we got married, she told me she wouldn't marry me. I was not a good guy. So I got, I got saved and we got married. Uh, but I've been saved for 50 years. And so right after I got saved, I read a book called The Late Great Planet Earth. And it was by a guy named Hal Lindsey. I think he came out in 1973 and that's the year we got married. And so um, I was fascinated by the fact that someone knew the future. Because I, I was always future oriented. I always thought about the future. But when you're lost, you have no idea what's about to happen. So there's just a lot of anxiety and unknowns. But Hal Lindsey was saying that God knows the future and that the Bible knows the future. And so that got me thinking about it. So I've been studying end time prophecy for 47 years. I've read hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books, studied the Bible, every prophecy in the Bible over and over and over. And I love it. I just absolutely love Bible prophecy. So what I want to do in this message is just kind of help you. And you may be someone that you really don't know a lot about Bible prophecy or you may know some about Bible prophecy. I just want to kind of take you on an overview, a prophetic timeline of the end. And what I want to do empirically is to prove to you we're living in the end times, empirically, because of the scriptures. Now, this is a book called Every Prophecy of the Bible by a man named John Walbert. He was the chancellor and president of Dallas Theological Seminary. He's considered the dean of prophecy teachers. Uh, and he says, according to Dr. Walbert, probably the most knowledgeable man on earth before his death about Bible prophecy. He says there are 1,000 prophecies in the Bible. Now this book, you see how thick it is. This is all the prophecies of the Bible. He's talking about all of them. 500 of those prophecies have been fulfilled. And 500 are still to be fulfilled. That's according to his book. So 30% of the Bible is prophecy. And most of that is about the time we're living in. The time we're living in is the most prophesied period of time in human history. And of course, I'll prove that to you in this message. The single most significant truth in all of Bible prophecy is the return of Jesus. The return of Jesus is mentioned 329 times in the Bible. There are 216 chapters in the New Testament. In the 216 chapters in the New Testament, the return of Jesus is mentioned 318 times. The return of Jesus is mentioned one out of 30 verses in the New Testament. Only four books in the New Testament don't talk about the return of Jesus, and they're very short books. And so the only one who can foretell the, pro the future is the one who controls it. See, why, why can the Bible foretell the future? Is because our God is in control. He's the great I am. You do understand God is not in time. Time is a prison of the theory of, the theory of relativity. Einstein's theory of relativity proves that time and space are a created dimension. And God created time and God's not in time. See, we're stuck in time. We're stuck here in 2023. We can't go back. We can't go forward. We're stuck right here. But God is the I am. He created time. He doesn't see time the way we see time. We see time right here. We're stuck right here. God sees time like this. He's over it. He's behind it. He's over it. He's in front of it. And he stands up here, up here in the future, and he looks back and he tells us what's going to happen with great accuracy because God spans time and God controls time. Let me say to all of your friends that maybe are other religions or they're atheists, tell them to produce a book that can foretell the future with accuracy. Not one of them can because our God is in control. Our God is the only true God. And prophecy proves that all the Bible is true. Now, there's a doomsday clock. And at the beginning of this year, the, atomic, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, Albert Einstein actually was the one who they began the atomic weapons. And the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists with Albert Einstein, they started the doomsday clock based on kind of a doomsday scenario of when the end of the world is going to come. At the beginning of this year, they set the doomsday clock at 100 seconds to midnight which means we're close to the end. Now they've changed that. It's now 90 seconds to midnight. And they're saying because of all the nuclear threats in the world, because of all the things that are going on, that mankind is looking at extinction. Now they're looking at it from a secular perspective. I want to look at it from a biblical perspective. And let me, let me kind of change their timeline. I believe we're 10 seconds from midnight. And I'll prove it in this message. When you look at what's happening in the world, we are at a place we've never been before, and the Bible told us we would be there. The Bible told us the details of how we would be there. 
And so I want to look at several different ways to, to measure end times and to prove this to you. First is prophetic fulfillment. What, what prophecies have been fulfilled? If I'm saying we're living in the end times, then we should see prophecies, very specific prophecies that have been fulfilled. We're going to talk about that. And I'm going to take you on a timeline from 1948 until today. I'm going to show you the, the scriptures that have been fulfilled. Prophetic timelines, the Bible tells us how long the end will be. The end, the last generation, it tells us how long the last generation will be. And then current events, the things that are happening in the news today that are part of Bible prophecy. Let's look at overall prophetic fulfillment. Now, if you went back 80 years to the year 1943, the question is how many end times prophecies had been fulfilled? Very few, just a few. Almost no end time prophecies had been fulfilled. And so in the 1900s, in the, the 19th century, the 1800s, some Jews were being heavily persecuted in Europe, just like today. And so they were coming in waves from Europe to Palestine. Before Israel was Israel, it was called Palestine. And so they were coming, the, the persecution was so intense in Europe, they were coming in waves, trying to find a homeland in Palestine that was very unaccommodating because the Arabs hated them and everybody else did too. And so in the, the Jewish Congress in 1897, a man named Theodore Herzl, began the Zionist Congress with the intention of beginning a Jewish state. He wanted there to be a nation of Israel. And Theodore Herzl said, if we can ever have a homeland, they will stop persecuting us. The reason we're being persecuted is because we don't have a homeland like everyone else. And so he began the movement for Israel to have a homeland. Eliezer ben Yehuda was a man in the 1800s, early 1900s. He revived the Hebrew language. I'll read you a couple of scriptures that he fulfilled. The Hebrew language, because the Jews had been scattered for 2,000 years, people didn't speak Hebrew anymore, and it just fell into disuse. And so this one man took the Hebrew language, revived it, and it's spoken in Israel. If you go to Israel, they speak Hebrew all over there. Zephaniah 3, 9. For then I will restore to the people a pure language, that they may all call on the name of the Lord to serve him with one accord. This is Ze Je uh, Jeremiah 31. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, they shall again use this speech in the land of Judah and its cities. When I bring back their captivity, the Lord bless you, O home of justice, O mountain of holiness. And so the Hebrew language was revived so God could bring back the children of Israel to the land. And so those are a couple of scriptures that were fulfilled in the late 19th, early 20th century. The Balfour Declaration was signed in 1917. The Balfour Declaration was a public statement issued by the British government in 1917 during the World War I, announcing its support of the establishing of a national home for the Jewish people. And so that was a big deal. And so early in the late in the 19th century, early in the 20th century, we began to see rumblings. Of, you know, Ezekiel 37 is the Valley of Dry Bones. The Israel, you know, the song, dim bones, dim bones, dim dry bones, that comes from Ezekiel 37. And God told Ezekiel, look at these bones because this is the house of Israel and they were all scattered out. And they began to shake and they began to come together. And so in the 20th century, God began to bring the Jews back into a homeland. I'm gonna read you Ezekiel 37. This is talking about the dry bones. I want you to think about the Holocaust when we read this scripture because this is fulfilled with the Holocaust. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. When I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves, I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. Well, the worst thing that's ever happened in the history of the world is the Holocaust. Six million Jews were killed. I think there were nine million Jews in Europe before World War II. There are like less than two million today. And so they killed six million Jews. It was because of the Holocaust that the United Nations had sympathy and allowed Israel to become a nation again. And so he brought them literally out of their graves and into the land of Israel in fulfillment of Ezekiel 37. So now we're going to begin. All of that's just a preamble, and now we're going to begin our timeline. I'm going to look at empirical, provable scriptures, measurable scriptures that prove we're living at the end of the end times. We're going to begin in 1948. Israel is the super sign of the end times. The end cannot happen until Israel is a nation. And Israel was not a nation from A.D. 70 
when the Romans defeated them, killed over a million Jews, destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the Temple Mount, and scattered the, Jew, the remaining Jews around the world. They were not a nation from 8070 until 1948. And when 1948 happened, it began the clock of the end times. This is Isaiah 11. This is prophetic fulfillment number one. And we're starting our timeline in 1948. Isaiah 11, it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left from Assyria and Egypt, from Pathros and Cush, from Elam and Shinar, from uh, Hamath and the islands of the sea. He will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcast of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Well, this happened on May 14th of 1948. The British mandate ended over Palestine and David Ben-Gurion, who was the leader of Israel, declared that they were a nation. Minutes later, Harry Truman, our president, affirmed them as a nation. Other nations began to do the same thing. So it says here, again for the, so in the end times, again for the second time, I'm going to bring Israel back into their land. The first time Israel was dispossessed is when they went to Babylon in the Old Testament for 70 years. But when they went to Babylon, they only came back from Babylon. They went to Babylon, to, which became Persia. They came back from there. This says, for the second time, I'm going to restore Israel and bring them back from all over the world. That happened in 1948, and that began, that was the clock that began the end times. Here's prophetic fulfillment number two, again in 1948, Isaiah 66. Before she was in labor, she gave birth. Before her pain came, she delivered a male child. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day, or a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children. Israel was born in one day. May 14th of 1948, miraculously, that in one day they became a nation in fulfillment of Isaiah 66. So they were recovered a second time. For, by the way, there's never been a nation in the history of the world that was dispossessed twice and came back. Israel's the only nation. And so, and they were created in one day. This is prophetic fulfillment number three. And we're going to move our timeline now to 1967, Luke 21. Now, this is going to begin in AD 70. Jesus is now talking about when the Romans are destroying Jerusalem in Israel. When you see Jerusalem, this is Jesus, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, let those who are in the midst of her depart. And let not those who are in the country enter her, for these are the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days, for there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Okay, so the Romans came, did every, every single thing that Jesus just prophesied there happened in AD 70, except for one sentence. Jerusalem would be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles were fulfilled. When Israel came back as a nation in 1948, they only had, had half the city of Jerusalem. They had the west half, they didn't have the east half. But in June of 1967, there was a six-day war, and in the six-day war, they took the whole city of Jerusalem. When the Bible says that Jerusalem's trampled, it means that non-Jews are governing it. When the Jews are governing it, it's not being trampled. And it says that the Gentiles, that the, the city of Jerusalem be trampled by Gentiles until the times the Gentiles were fulfilled. In 1967, this was fulfilled. It began in 8070, it was fulfilled in 1967. So there's a timeline of 1948, when Israel came back for the second time in one day, and in 1967, they got back to the city of Jerusalem. Okay, this is number four, prophetic fulfillment. 1989, Russian Jews immigrate to Israel. This is Jeremiah 16, and it says here, this by the way, this is repeated in Jeremiah 23. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that it shall no more be said, the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt. But the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands where he had driven them, for I will bring them back into their land, which I gave to their fathers. This is Jeremiah 31. Thus says the Lord, sing with gladness for Jacob and shout among the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise and say, O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. Behold, I will gather them from the north country and gather them from the ends of the earth. Among them, the blind and the lame, the woman and child, and the one who labors with child together, a great throng of them shall return there. They shall come with weeping and with supplications I will lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of water 
in a straight way where they shall not stumble, for I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. The Iron Curtain fell in 1989. The Russian, the Soviet Union fell in 1989. Since 1989, 1.7 Russian Jews have immigrated back to Israel. We did a leadership conference about 10 years ago in Jerusalem, and the Russians got mad at us because we didn't have an interpreter for them. I didn't know there was that many of them. There's a bunch of them over there. And a bunch of Messianic Russian Jews over there, 1.7 million. And a lot of people, I don't know if that map is available here. I think we may have, there it is right here. If you'll notice on this map, because I want you to notice something a lot of people, on the very, just look on the left side of the map. But that's the Middle East. Uh, but right on the left-hand side of the map where it says Turkey, right in the left middle there, right below where it says Turkey, you really can't see it, is Jerusalem. Right above Egypt there, that's where Jerusalem is. If you go directly north of, is, for, of Jerusalem to the very, very top of the map, that's Moscow. Moscow is directly north of Jerusalem. A lot of people don't realize that. The north country is Russia. And so when the Bible is prophesying that there's going to be a, a group of people brought back from the north country to Israel, that happened beginning in 1989 and it's still happening today. And by the way, the Ukrainian Jews are still coming back to Israel. So this is a miraculous thing. So let's go to the year 2000. Prophetic fulfillment number five, 2000 until now. This is Daniel chapter 12. Daniel is a very, very prophetic book. Tremendous end time prophecy in the book of Daniel. At that time, this is, at that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who watches over the sons of your people. There shall be a time of trouble, such as there was never what, never was since there was a nation, even at that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book of life and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many will run to and fro, and knowledge will increase. So the angel is speaking, Gabriel speaking to Daniel, and he says, Daniel, all these prophecies, all this is going to happen. I want you to seal it up. Because it will not be understood until the very end. And when the end comes, travel will increase and knowledge will increase. That's how you'll know you're living at the end when this can be understood, the times we're living in now. So travel, for most of human history, people could go about 20 miles a day, 30 miles a day. In Texas, I don't know about Arizona, but our county seats are 30 miles apart. The reason 30 miles apart is that's how far a person could travel in a day. A horse can only go for like 25 miles in a day or so. So trains revolutionized travel in the 19th century, cars and buses again in the 20th century. The greatest advancement of travel is when the average person could fly commercial air travel. Now that we have commercial space travel, this being made available to a few rich people. But travel, if you go into your Phoenix airport, you'll be breathing air that was breathed yesterday in China all over the world because people travel so commonly. Knowledge is increasing at an unbelievable rate. This is a little article from industrytap.com. It said, Buckminster Fuller created the knowledge doubling curve. He noticed until 1900, human knowledge dub uh, doubled approximately every century, every 100 years. By the end of World War II, knowledge was doubling every 25 years. Today, things are not as simple as different types of knowledge have different rates of growth. For example, nan nanotechnology knowledge is doubling, doubling every two years. Clinical knowledge is doubling every 18 months. But on average, human knowledge is doubling every 13 months. But according to IBM, the building out of the Internet of Things will lead to knowledge doubling every 12 hours. Now, right now, knowledge is doubling every two to three months. What we know today, before it was 100 years that it took for knowledge to double, now it's about two to three months. Now, does anybody know about chat GPT? You ever heard about that? Well, it's absolutely amazing. I was playing golf with a guy one day, and he said, you know what ChatGPT is? And I said, no. He said, well, look at watch. He said, who's Jimmy Evans? He turned and put his phone like this. It told me. It told me, it told me things about myself I didn't know. <laughs> In one second. And then he said, write a, write a rap song about Jimmy Evans. He wrote a rap song about Jimmy Evans. <laughs> so it's absolutely amazing. AI, was only, by the way, that's only been out for like four months. Knowledge and travel have absolutely been revolutionized. I said the year 2000, I'm on a timeline here, and I began in 1948, now I'm up to the year 2000 here. So we are seeing, we are seeing empirically, you can't make this stuff up. We are traveling and we have knowledge like has never existed in human history. And the, the angel told Gabriel, 
until, when the end comes, this is going to be known. You'll know when the end has come because travel will increase and knowledge will increase. Here's prophetic fulfillment number six. This is 2010. The apostasy of the West from traditional Christianity. Apostasy means falling away. It means you once had it, and now you have fallen away from it. 2 Thessalonians 2. The book of 1 Thessalonians, every chapter talks about the return of Christ. When Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians, it, a, a rumor went out that the rapture had come and the church at Thessalonica had been left behind. Well, that would upset you, wouldn't it? So just several weeks after Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians, he wrote 2 Thessalonians to comfort the Thessalonican church that they had not been left behind. And he's only going to use one sign about the end times. This, now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you for any means. That day will not come unless the falling away. That's the word apostasy. It means apostasy. That day will not come until the apostasy comes first. And the man of sin is revealed. That's the Antichrist, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped. So he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. There's going to be a rebuilt temple in Israel. We were in Israel in December. They've had all the preparations for the temple to be rebuilt. I'll maybe talk about that a little bit later in the message. This Antichrist. Do you not remember that when I was with you, I told you these things, and now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Now the word he there is capitalized. The he is the Holy Spirit in the church. Let me give you the good news. Jesus is coming for us, and we're going to be raptured. Before the tribulation happens, the worst seven years in human history, Jesus is going to come and take us to be with him and to be the bride of Christ forever and ever. And so it says that he who now restrains, who is restraining abortion in the earth? We are, the church. Who is restraining all the nonsense, the woke stuff that's happening right now? Not all the church, but we are. And <laughs> the restrainer is, the, the, the church was birthed on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit fell. The Holy Spirit, the He is the Holy Spirit in the church. We are the restraining force in the earth, but the restrainer will be taken out of the way. Then the Antichrist will be revealed. That's what it says. The mystery of lawlessness, it says, now you know what is restraining, that He may be revealed in His own time, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only He who now restrains will do so until He is taken away, and then the lawless one will be revealed. And people say, Jimmy, who do you think the Antichrist is? Let me just tell you, there's a lot of good candidates. <laughs> Can I just say, I've got a list about a mile long with people that could very well, you know. But the, the restrainer will take us away, and then the Antichrist will be real. So we don't know. I think it's useless to speculate who it is. We don't know. Whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Let me tell you, the devil's end is a bad ending, and Jesus is going to destroy him. And that's the message here. The coming of the lawless one. This is talking about the Antichrist. You'll know the Antichrist is coming according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie that they may all be condemned who did not believe the truth that had pleasure in righteous. Let me just teach you something here real quick. It says here that verse 10, that Satan is going to come with all unrighteous deception. It says, for this reason, God's going to give them strong delusion. Let me teach you something. Deception comes from the devil. Delusion comes from God. Deception is when the devil comes because you have rejected truth. He comes and tells you something that's wrong. And you're open to it because you don't know the truth. You reject the truth. Delusion is when God flips a switch in your brain and you can't receive truth. And it's punishment. You reject truth, you reject truth, you reject truth, you reject truth, you reject truth. God says, fine, I'll just give you delusion. And what we see today in our world is not just deceived people, we see deluded people. They're, they're off their rocker. They're crazier than a bunch of bed bugs. <laughs> they really are. And so the, the apostasy, Paul says, don't, don't be troubled, don't be troubled. Hey, when the end comes, you'll know it because there's gonna be a great falling away from the truth, from what you once professed, which is Christianity in the West, there's gonna be a great falling away. So in California, speaking of that, California. 
Oh, we're close to them, aren't we? In Texas, we feel a lot better about talking about them. We have to be careful here. There's other. They passed a law that if a child can get to California uh, by any means, hitchhiking, a relative, a friend, running away, whatever, once they get to California, that they will negate the parental rights of their parents, that they will take emergency custody of that child and protect them while they transition. And there's no such thing as transitioning. There's, you can't change your sex. You can change your mind, but you can't change your sex just because you change your mind. And there's a war on parents in America and traditional values like I never thought I would see in my lifetime. Yeah. And I can't even believe we're having the conversations that we're having. Yeah. It's just, it's craziness. It is delusion. It's delusional. Uh, 200, 210 Democrats, this is not a political message, but 210 Democrats in the House of Representatives voted against giving care for infants who survive abortions. A viable human infant is laying there, it survived an abortion, and 210 intelligent adults said, let them die. Do not let them have medical care. Because it's going to get in the way of our ideologies and our quest to do what we do. Public schools, universities teaching children radical ideologies against their parents' values, believing they know better than the parents. Let me tell you, parents know more than they will ever know about their child. But they're, they're telling us, we know more than you know, and we're going to take possession of your children, and we're going to teach them right and keep it from you. We're going to keep it from you. We're going to let your child, child transition in California, and we're going to keep it from you. Uh, a Christian teacher in California quit because she refused to uh, deceive parents uh, and keep them from knowing about their children. 80-year-old woman in Washington State was banned from life from the YMCA for trying to get a man out of the girls' locker room. They protected him and banned her for life. A dude in a girl's swimsuit walked into the dressing room. She was getting undressed, and all these young girls were in there undressed. And this dude walks in, and she steps in front of him. She said, hey, you're a man. Get out of here. They banned her for life. That's a good woman. That's a smart woman. That's a courageous woman. We call that the hero. This is not a political message. President of the United States pushing an agenda to transition children as young as five years old and to indoctrinate children on sex and gender as young as five years old. The sexualization of children is the most shocking thing I've seen in my lifetime. And pedophiles, they're now changing that to minor attracted persons because they don't want to offend them. Minor attracted persons. We're, we're seeing this falling away. About 2010, the reason I started 2010 it really has been more since the last seven or eight years, but since 2010, we've seen this, this moral freefall. This is prophetic fulfillment, fulfillment number seven, and this is now. This, this brings us to now. This is Revelation 11. This is talking about the two witnesses in Jerusalem, very powerful men, Moses and Elijah or Enoch and Elijah. I personally believe it may be Enoch and Elijah because there are two men in the Old Testament that never died. Revelation 11, I will appoint my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1260 days. That's three and a half years. Clothed in sackcloth, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands and they stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes down from, from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. They have the power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. They have power to turn the waters into blood and strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Now, when they are finished with their testimony, the beast that comes from the abyss will attack them and overpower them and kill them. Their bodies will lie in the public square of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some from every tribe, from, from people, a tribe, nation, language, and nation, will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other gifts because these two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. But after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet and terror struck uh, those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. So for the first three and a half years of the tribulation, the two witnesses are untouchable. And they're absolutely hated. Now, when people send gifts to each other when you die, that's not good. And these men are so hated that when they die, the entire earth gloats over them. What is men now? So, what is men? So, uh, well, first of all, why, the, the first thing the Antichrist does, and this is, this is found in Daniel, well, several places, Daniel 9, 27, 
He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. This is seven years. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. So after the Antichrist kills the two witnesses, the first thing he does is stop sacrifices. Well, they're preparing right now to rebuild the temple and to start animal sacrifices. Understand this. So, so people say the covenant that the Antichrist confirms with Israel, will that give them the ability to rebuild the temple? It doesn't matter because the two witnesses will protect the temple builders one way or the other. The two witnesses are untouchable. If anyone tries to kill them, they're killed in like manner. They can call down fire from heaven. They can stop rain from all over the earth for people who give them lip. These guys are untouchable. And for three and a half years, they're protecting the temple builders and the sacrifices. Imagine what PETA will do when animals start being sacrificed on the temple mount. They will go berserk. The new, all the news of the world will go berserk. They will go crazy. And the two witnesses are up there and they say, you want to give us lip? You remember that guy yesterday that we toasted? We'll toast you too. <laughs> you can give us any lip up here. And so everyone can't touch him for three and a half years. After three and a half years, the Antichrist kills him and people are just celebrating. Oh, we're so sick of those guys. They're preaching the gospel. They're telling us that God is real. They're telling us the Bible's true. We're so sick of those people and they're letting all those animals be sacrificed up on the Temple Mount. They're absolutely hated. That's not the most significant thing here. So, do you understand now that two or three hundred years ago, it took months for news to be delivered around the world? You have to have ships that went for countries. You didn't know news that happened until weeks or months after it happened. No one knew what was happening. This says the whole earth is the whole earth is going to gloat over them for the three and a half days that they're dead. The whole earth. The inhabitants of the earth are going to gloat over them the entire time they're laying in the street. Okay? And they're sending gifts to each other. That's impossible in any other generation of ours. So there was a preacher in South Texas in the 1920s, and he made this statement, preaching on Bible prophecy in the 1920s. He said, the end can't happen until Israel's a nation, until everyone on earth can see the same thing at the same time. Well, they thought it was a nut. Israel will never be a nation. And how could everybody on earth see the same thing at the same time? Today, 6.92 billion people in the earth have a smartphone. Not a phone, they have a smartphone. There are only 8 billion people in the world. If you remove the children, every adult on earth has a smartphone right now. For the first time in human history, we can all watch the same thing at the same time. And when the Antichrist kills the two witnesses, the earth will be going, look here, look what just happened. They killed those guys. And they start sending gifts to each other. That couldn't have happened 50 years ago. Couldn't happen 30 years ago, but it can happen today. And what I'm saying is we have prophecies. These are empirical. These are empirical. They're provable. They're measurable. This is not emotional. This is not, you know, subjective. These are prophecies that tell us we're living at the end of the end times. I don't believe we're living at the end of the, or, or in the end times. I believe we're living at the end of the end times. I believe that Jesus is about to come. You say, when? I don't know exactly when, but I'm just telling you the prophecies are coming true. And we started in 1948, and now we're to today, where everyone on earth can watch the same thing at the same time, where there's been an apostasy in the last five to 10 years, like nothing we've ever seen before, and it's picking up steam. So let's look, that, that's fulfilled prophecies. That's the first thing I was gonna talk about. Here, the second thing is prophetic timelines. Well, how long is the end times? That's a good question. Because some people say, well, Jimmy, the end times could last three or 400 years. No, it really can't. Because the Bible tells us that it's a short period of time. This is Joel chapter two. This is God in the first person. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant who the Lord calls. For behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, 1948, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. They've also divided up my land. Now, this is a very important text of scripture. But let me just go back to where it says, uh, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, 
I'm going to bring all the nations together in the Valley of Jehoshaphat. The Valley of Jehoshaphat is the valley between the Mount of Olives and the Temple Mount. This is Zechariah 14, Revelation 19. This is where Jesus comes back, his feet touch the Mount of Olives, and he enters into judgment with all the nations that have come against Jerusalem. This is Armageddon. In those days and at the same time, when I bring back Israel, I'm going to enter into judgment with all the nations on account of my people, my heritage Israel. Well, it starts here, and it says, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Well, you're thinking, well, that had not happened. It has happened exactly. So a friend of mine named Mark Biltz is a pastor in Washington State. He wrote a book called Blood Moons. He's an astronomy buff. And so he, he used NASA program, NASA astronomy program, and he went back to study, have there been so, lunar eclipses on Jewish holy days in history? Uh, and because the blood moon is a lunar eclipse. When the Bible says the moon, when it says the moon, sun doesn't give us light, that's a solar eclipse. So he found that in the last like 600 years, there's been four times when there were four blood moons on Jewish holy days in consecutive years. Two in one year, two in another year. In 1492 and 1493, two years in a row, there were lunar eclipses on the Feast of Passover and the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, the next year, the same thing happened. You say, well, what's 1492 and 1493? That's when the Jews were expelled from Spain. King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella ex expelled the Jews from Spain. Uh, Columbus was a Jew. He was a Murano. He was a, a Jew that pretended to be a Catholic, kept from being persecuted. The purpose for his joy voyage to the New World was to find a safe place for the Jews to live. America has been the safest place for the Jews to live except for Israel for hundreds of years. And so, and you can look all that up, just Google it, that... Uh, in 1492, there were four blood moons. The second time it happened was in 1949 and 1950. Even though Israel became a nation in 1948, they didn't set up their government until 1949 to 1950. In 1949-1950, there were four blood moons, four, four lunar eclipses on Jewish holy days in successive years. It happened again in 1967 and 1968. Four blood moons. Remember 1967 is when Jerusalem came back? It happened again in 2014, 2015. It won't happen again for another 600 years. You say, well, Jimmy, what's the significance? This is my opinion. Um, in, 2000, in 1492, 1493, God began to take the holy people that had been scattered from around the world and began to bring them back together again. In 1949 and 50, he began to take the holy land and bring it back together. In 1967 and 1968, he took the holy city and brought it back together. In 2014, 2015, it's the holy temple. Since, the ninth, since 2014 and 15, the activity on the Temple Mount has exponentially increased. Thousands of Jews are going up on the Temple Mount to pray and worship every year, which they were not able to do before. And last year in December, we were in Israel. We went to the Temple Institute in Jerusalem. We went through the Temple Institute. We walked in the door. They began to show us all of the garments, all the musical instruments, all of the, the utensils that are going to be used in the next temple, they said, these are not replicas. These are not replicas. They have the menorah up in the square in the Jewish quarter there. They said, this is not a replica. This is the menorah that will go in the new temple. All of these garments, all these musical instruments, all these utensils, we're going to use these in the new temple. On the way out the door, the last thing you see on the way out the door of the Temple Institute presentation is the Ark of the Covenant. It's a replica. And they say this, this is a replica of the Ark of the Covenant. We know where the Ark of the Covenant is, and when the time comes, we'll go get it. They're ready to rebuild. They're ready to rebuild. The activity. So I'm saying to you, when it says here, the sun, will, and by the way, in, in 2014, 2015, there was a solar eclipse on the first day of Israel's religious year, and there was a partial eclipse on the Feast of Trumpets. The sun won't give us light. The moon will be turned into blood. Those things were cryptic before, but now we're beginning to understand what they mean. But it says here, Behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations, bring them down the valley of Jehoshaphat, enter into judgment with them on account of my people, my heritage Israel, whom they've scattered among the nations. They've also divided up my land. Well, here's a book by a buddy of mine, William Koenig. It's called Eye to Eye. And he's a, he's a journalist. He was a, a White House correspondent for 20 years. The subtitle of this book is Facing the Consequences of Dividing Israel. 
124 documented examples of every time the United States tried to divide the land of Israel and historic natural disasters that have hit America. 124 documents. Let me just give you a few examples here. Um, and that is Hurricane Katrina in 2005, under the George Bush, George W. Bush administration, we forced Israel out of the Gaza Strip. The Gaza Strip is on the Mediterranean Sea. Very, very lucrative. Very, very strategic. We physically forced Israel out of the Gaza Strip. Five days later, Hurricane Katrina hit the Gulf Coast. The costliest natural disaster in American history. And immediately, Jewish rabbis said, that's what you get for forcing us out of our land. God says, this is the King Jimmy version. I'm ticked. <laughs> I'm ticked because of how you treated my people, and I'm ticked because you're dividing up my land. The land of Israel belongs to God. You've divided up my land, and I'm angry about it. So Hurricane Ian that hit Florida last year, you know what happened at the exact moment that Hurricane Ian hit the Florida coast? President Biden was giving a speech at the United Nations calling for a two-state solution. You know what a two-state solution means? It means East Jerusalem goes to the Palestinians. They divide Israel. Uh, when President Biden, this is not a political speech. I'm tr not trying to be political. When, <laughs> I'm, I'm, talk, I'm just preaching on the end times. The president just happens to be. You know, I'm so sorry. I, Pastor Mark, please, Pastor Mark didn't ask me to say any of this. I'm, I'm saying, but he was giving a speech in the United Nations calling for a division of Israel. And that means Jerusalem is about 200,000 Jews lose their home in Jerusalem. 400,000 Jews lose their home in the West Bank. And they give the Golan Heights back to the Syrians. The, goal, the last time the Syrians had the Golan Heights, the Golan Heights sit here. The Sea of Galilee area sits here. And the last time the, the Syria had it, they used it to bomb Israel during the, the Six-Day War, 67. And so it's a very strategic area. And so our current administration is saying, let's go back to pre-1967 boundaries and divide the land of Israel. While he was giving that speech, Hurricane Ian hit the Florida coast. In December of 2021, a tornado, the longest tornado in American history, 200, 230 miles long, it hit four states, did tremendous amount of damage. As that was happening, the uh, current administration at that time was trying to force Israel to stop building 900 homes for Jews in East Jerusalem. What your president does, I'm not talking about Democrat or Republican, and Democrats and Republicans have done the same exact thing. What your president does directly affects your well-being. And God says, I'm ticked. I'm angry. I'm going to bring the world together to the Valley of Jehoshaphat. I'm going to bring the whole world together. Armageddon's going to happen. And it's going to happen because the way you treated my people Israel, and you've divided up my land, I'm saying, this is happening. This is happening. So God says, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, I'm bringing all the nations down to the valley of Armageddon. I'm entering a judgment with you. So I'm just saying, if a generation began in 1948, and this is, this is a, so this is Jesus now, the same question is, how long does the end last? This is Matthew 24. Learn this parable from the fig tree. By the way, Matthew 24 is all end times. When his branches become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. So he's talking about the end times. And he's talking about all, he talked about all the, the end time signs in Matthew 24. The disciples came to him privately on the Mount of Olives. And they said, Lord, when's the end going to come? And he gives all the signs of the end time. He says, now when you see these things begin to happen... You know, the generation that sees these things happen will see all things fulfilled. That's why I'm saying it's going to be a one-generation event by Joel 3 and also Matthew 24. And so the question is, how long is the generation? And the Bible has to interpret the Bible. This is not open to personal opinion. And here's what Psalm 90 says. The days of our lives are 70 years. And if by reason of strength, they're 80 years. Now, I turned 70 this year. And Pastor Mark, I know the Bible is inerrant, but I think there's a mistake here. <laughs> I want to live longer. So a generation is between 70 and 80 years. In 1959, the average life expectancy was 69.9 years. And currently it's 76 years. It's dropped a little bit because of COVID. So 70 to 80 years. So go back to 1948. 
If a generation, if the generation of the end started on May of 1948, we're almost 75 years into it. The days of man's life are 70 years, or by reason of strength, they're 80 years. So we've already, we've already gone past the 70-year mark from 1948, and now we're approaching 80. So you say, Jimmy, you're saying Jesus, are you setting dates? I'm not setting dates. I never set dates. All I'm saying is this is empirical. If we're the generation, we know that Jesus, Jesus could not have talked about his generation. They all died. But we have seen, if you were alive, I was born in 1953. Some of you were born 1948 or before. You are that generation. That you will not, this generation will not pass away until all things are fulfilled. So let me talk about current events here just real quickly and I'll close. What is happening right now in the world today is absolutely announcing the end and the return of Jesus. Let's begin with worldwide anti-Semitism. Armageddon is about the world hating Israel and specifically Jerusalem, the issue of Jerusalem, Ze Zechariah 12. The burden of the word of the Lord against Israel, thus says the Lord who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth and forms the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples. When they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem, it shall happen on that day I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all people, all who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all the nations of the earth have gathered against it. That's Armageddon. When all the nations, and by the way, uh, the United Nations has now appealed to the International Court of Justice because of Israel's occupation of the West Bank, which they call Judea and Samaria, and the International Court of Justice. They're asking them for how they should respond to Israel because of their violations. Uh, the United Nations has censured Israel more than all of the nations combined. In 2020, they censured them 17 times and all the other nations four times. And so that you could call the United Nations the anti-Israel club. And so the, the, there's an article in Jerusalem Post, I'm not gonna read it here, but they're saying that the anti-Semitism in this world is right now the worst it's ever been and it's worse than the 1930s in Europe. An article from Al Jazeera talks about how much the, in the Al Jazeera's Arab, and so they're talking about how much the United Nations has rebuked Israel. And so the anti-Semitism in the world today, the end is about the world hating Israel. The end is about the world trying to force Israel into a two-state solution. It's in our news every day. The, Israel's a tiny, tiny, tiny little nation in the Middle East. Who could care about Israel? It's supernatural. There's just no way that you could just say Guam. Guam is in the news every day. Well, what, what about Guam? Well, we don't even talk about Guam. It's little. There's not very many people there. But Israel is in the center of the news because the end is here and God is doing something supernatural. The Gog and Magog War. Now, the Gog and Magog War, let me just tell you this real quick because I'm about to close. There's a, there's a war that's coming. It was prophesied in Ezekiel 38 and it's between Russia. Ezekiel 38 is a, a prophecy against a man named Gog who is the leader of the Russian forces and an allied Muslim force, which is the stand states, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Iran, Persia, Turkey, Togarma and Garma, and Sudan and Libya and things like that. So uh, there's a crazy man right now in Russia, Vladimir Putin, threatening to nuke anyone that comes against him. He leads a coalition of Iran and Russia are very, very close. The stand states, Turkey, all these nations are aligned with Russia. And it says they come down to take booty and plunder and to take the land back. Well, 10 years ago, you would say to yourself, why on earth would Russia want to come and invade Israel? I mean, what, what could Israel possibly have that Russia would want? Well, 31 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. It's been discovered in the last few years. We were in Caesarea on the sea in December, and we saw the big gas rig out there. And so the Nord Stream pipeline's been blown up. I don't know by who. <laughs> I'm not gonna talk about Biden again, I can promise you that. <laughs> I'm leaving that one alone. But the Nord Stream pipeline, which means that gas can't be pumped to Europe from Russia, so guess who's selling gas to Europe? Israel. It was in the news today that they're negotiating with Italy. They're building a pipeline to Europe to sell 31 trillion cubic feet of natural gas, which is a just unbelievable amount of natural gas. To your, isn't it amazing that Israel is now the leading gas supplier in that area of the world? And everybody hates Russia anyway. All the Europeans, they want to get away from buying European gas. So Israel's mad, or the, 
Russia's mad and they want to come down and take that gas away from them and all that, but the Muslims want the land back. See, what a lot of people don't realize Persia, uh, Iran has hypersonic missiles that can reach Israel in 400 seconds. That's 6.66 minutes. That's fast. And they're developing nuclear warheads. This is the news every day. I'm just telling you this one in the news. They're enriching fissile material right now. Our State Department, our Pentagon said to Israel last week that Iran can get enough fissile material for a nuclear warhead in 12 days. That's what we told Israel. And they have a hypersonic missile that can deliver it. Well, Israel's not going to stand around and wait to get nuked. I can tell you that right now. And they've got an incredible uh, intelligence department that knows a lot about what's happening in, in Iran. So my personal opinion is Israel will bomb Iran. Uh, we're supposed to go to Israel in December. I told my wife this week, I don't think we're going to go. <laughs> I, I, think, I don't think there'll be a war by then. I mean, I just don't know how there couldn't be. It's an existential threat. Israel, Israel is just this tiny little nation. If you nuke them, one nuke, they're gone. And they, so if they nuke Iran, Russia has already warned America and Israel, you nuke Iran, you're going to deal with us. Well, that's the Gog and Magog war. It's Ezekiel 38 and 39. Read it for yourself. This is a prophesied war that hasn't happened. And I believe that there's a hook that's going to be put in Russia's jaw to pull them down. A hook was an animal hook that you used on a stubborn donkey to drag them around. And God is telling Russia, you don't make the decisions here. But there's a crazy man in Russia right now leading all this coalition. And Iran, Iran and Russia are very close. Iran, the, Iran is not Iran. It is the Islamic Republic of Iran. They believe that Allah has called them to destroy Israel and usher in the end times. They have their own end times theology. They believe that it is their responsibility to usher in the end times by destroying Israel. And so they're crazy. They're dedicated to destroying Israel. They will not stop. They have defied the international community in getting nuclear weapons and things like that. And so I'm just saying, when I say we have 10 seconds to midnight, I'm just saying what's happening in the news right now is what the Bible prophesied would happen 2,500 years ago. And one other thing to talk about, and that's the third temple that's coming. So they have to have a red heifer. They have to have a spotless red heifer to be able to cleanse the temple mount and the priest to be able to begin temple service. Uh, there's been nine red heifers in uh, history, and the Jews believe that the 10th red heifer will usher in the Messiah, the reign of the Messiah. So last September uh, in Texas, there were five perfect red heifers shipped from Dallas-Fort Worth Airport to Jerusalem. Now, I interviewed on my podcast the rabbi, the Jewish rabbi who's responsible for the red heifers. They're all perfect, these red heifers. Now, they have to stay perfect for two years and one day. If they have one white hair on them, they're, they're not kosher any longer. But right now, there's five perfect ones. If, and I think they have about a year more to go before they can deem them kosher or not kosher. If, they have everything else ready for the temple. If one of these red heifers is deemed kosher in the next year or so, they will be able to burn it and take its ashes and purify the temple mount and build the third temple and usher in the Messiah, like they say. So we're seeing some very interesting things happen in the world. Now, let me say this. Uh, so this is, this is the end of my message. So you say, what do I do now? Well, let me say, okay. Live your life. Don't stop living your life. A lot of you are young. Uh, get married, have kids, buy a house, get a job, serve Jesus. Um, Plan like Jesus isn't coming back for 100 years. But live like he's coming today. Don't stop living your life. Don't stop living your life. Because, you know, we've been talking about the end times for a long time. The worst thing you can do is plan and pray and, and do what you believe that God's told you to do. Live your life. Stay in church. Stay in church. This is Hebrews 10. Let us consider how we may spur one another on, love, on, on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. It's saying here, you need to be in church even more when the end comes. So as adults, don't you feel better when you come to church? Yes. But don't you feel better? Your children need to be in church more than any time in the history of the world. Our children. There are no kitty demons, and there's no junior devil. Our children are under full-scale assault every single day. 
wherever they go. They need God and they need church. Stay in church, keep your family in church, serve God and fulfill your God-given destiny. Now, what a lot of people don't realize is we're saved by grace, but we're judged according to our works. Our works matter. Uh, Revelation 22, this is Jesus. Behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now, the good thing about the judgment seat of Christ is a judgment of rewards. For the bad stuff we've done, it goes away. It's, it's forgiven. There's no condemnation at the judgment seat of Christ. No one gets beaten or anything like that. It's, it's all good. But some people will be richer than others in eternity. God is not a socialist. <laughs> he isn't. And you know something? You don't have to climb out Everest to get God's attention. Jesus said, if you give a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, you won't lose your reward. So when you live your life every day, just understand the bad things we do, thank God for the grace of Jesus. Because all of us need a lot of grace to get through every day. But did you know when you do something right, it's, it's a big deal. And there'll be an eternal reward. The things that we've forgotten, God doesn't forget. The things that may seem insignificant to us are not insignificant with God. And so live your life for Jesus. Live your life to do good for Jesus and to be a witness to other people. Let me say, witnessing is not what you do, it's who you are. You don't know to have to know a shred of theology to be a witness. All witnessing is, is let me tell you what Jesus did for me. I'm not gonna argue the Bible with, with you because I, I don't do that. But I'm just telling you, I was lost and now I'm found. I was blind and now I see. I was in bondage and now I've been set free. And I'm just telling you, that's what Jesus did for me. You can believe it or not believe it, but I'm just telling you, that's what Jesus did for me. And the most important thing we can do is share our faith with another person. Bow your heads with me if you would. Lord, thank you for this precious group of people. You know, it just gives us hope in the world we're living in. Jesus, to know that you're coming. And we're not escapists, Lord, but you told us to pray that we would be worthy to escape all these things and to stand before the Son of Man. We thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus. We thank you for that. And I just pray, Lord, and I just, I'm just sensing right now that, that there, the, the devil has really attacked some of you with anxiety and depression. And I'm speaking to some people online right now too. Anxiety and depression is one of his favorite things. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, but Satan is the Prince of Anxiety. I speak against anxiety and fear in the name of Jesus. I bind it and I pray for the peace of Jesus to fall right now. Lord, let our mind be drawn to you and to your word and not the troubling things that are happening in the world. I bind depression, a spirit of heaviness in Jesus' name. And I pray for joy. I pray for the oil of joy to come upon your people, Lord, as never before. Just a lightheartedness, a lightness. Let this grief, there's some of you that have been grieving for years over some things that have happened. And tonight, your grief is over. And the joy of the Lord is gonna come into your life and replace that. Lord, touch us where we need to be touched. Give hope where there's hopelessness, joy where there's grief, praise where there's heaviness. I just bless these people. I bless this church. I just pray that this is going to be the greatest season in this church and for these people. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name, amen. Bless you guys.